Hello everybody and welcome to my talk on real-time continual learning from short video. My name is Davide Maltoni, I am a professor at the University of Bologna. Here I am. So my lab is uh, part of computer science department at the University of Bologna. We are located in Cesena and other members of my lab involved in this research are Vincenzo Lomonaco, Lorenzo Pellegrini and Gabriele Graffietti. To better explain you our aim and motivation, I prefer to start this presentation from the end of the story by showing you an application that we developed. It's uh, an Android application for a smartphone with no hardware acceleration, so running on CPU. And this application uh, is able to train a mobile net in near real time, starting from short video of about 20 seconds. You can load this video that I'm showing you from this link, and if you want, you can also download the application from the second link and install it on your Android smartphone. So this, this application starts in inference mode, and the, the mobile net was pre-trained on Core 50 dataset. So Core 50 dataset has 10 macro categories. So as we show object, to the model, he can recognize the object by showing a green frame around the icon of the object here. For example, this is a marker and is correctly recognized as a marker. So now we switch to training mode and first we would like to improve recognition capability of existing categories. So we first show this plug adapter. This is similar to an adapter in the training set, so it's properly recognized. This second adapter is also recognized. But the third one is, is black. There are no black adapters in the training set, so it's not recognized. So we start a, a training session and we takes about uh, 100 frames at uh, 4 or 5 frames per second by moving the object in front of the camera, some rotation, some pose changes, and also we change the distance from the camera. Okay, at the end of the acquisition, the training takes place very quickly, less than one second, and now switch to inference mode and properly recognize the new object and also the previous one. Okay, this is the second training mode. Now we would like to add a new category. In inference mode, the model recognized mobile phones but not this object. Uh, this is a stapler. Stapler is not a macro category in Core 50, so we provide a new category, provide the name of the new category, and then again we collect a short video of about 20 seconds. Again by moving the object, rotation, poses, different angle distances, Okay, training, now again inference mode, and now the model is able to recognize the object, and also, in this case, another object of another color, and still recognize object of previous categories. So, as you have seen in the previous video, our interest is on online continuous learning for computer vision. We focus on real applications. There are several interesting applications, for example, in robotics. Imagine a robot navigating an environment. It must be able to recognize objects 
and improve its recognition capabilities during the time. There are also several interesting applications in smart cameras, both for industrial application and surveillance. For example, in surveillance application, uh, a, a camera operating outdoor, you know that typically at the beginning there are a lot of false alarms, and with continuous learning you can try to improve the capabilities of the camera by filtering uh, false alarms and so on. Typically, all this application runs on uh, hardware with limited computation capabilities. Uh, we need uh, real-time or near-real-time updates. And also, typically, the input are frames uh, which are highly correlated and uh, non-independent. For privacy reasons, we would like also to avoid uh, server-side processing or storing raw data. On, on the cloud. Well, we are in a continuous learning uh, workshop, so I assume you already know the basic stuff, uh, the problem of forgetting, the main continuous learning metrics, uh, and the difference between multitask and single incremental task scenario. In single incremental task, uh, the model must be able to sequentially learn new classes, new categories, and new instances of the, the same classes, as in the video. And uh, we believe this is much more interesting for practical application. Fortunately, most of the research groups are now working in this scenario. So in single incremental task, you have a first batch and a number of incremental batches. And depending on the content of these incremental batches, we can have three cases. The first case, new instances and I. In this case, in the incremental batches, we have only new instances, but not new classes. So new instances of existing classes. This is the case of uh, open lorries or Core 50 datasets. In the new classes and C scenario, this is also no known as uh, incremental class learning. The um, incremental batches contains uh, only new classes. This is the case, for example, for MNIST, Cypher 10, Cypher 100, ImageNet 100, ImageNet, and again, Core 50. And in the third one, in the incremental batches, you have both new instances of existing classes and new classes. And there is a specific benchmark on this in Core 50. Well, in the previous slide, I mentioned some popular dataset benchmark. And uh, I think that some of them are not ideal for some continuous learning application. Because, for example, of the low resolution, this is the case for MNIST and Cypher, or because the small number of incremental batches, typically 5, 10, or 25. And also, ImageNet uh, is not uh, appropriate for some application because uh, the instances of the same class are independent. And uh, it is unlikely that uh, in some application the system experiences at time t plus 1 a set of independent frames or images of the same class. It is more realistic that it encounters a new object and observe it uh, under different poses. Still focusing on uh, practical application, some of the constraints enforced by some researchers, I think, are not optimal. For example, training from a single frame instead of a video, or learning from scratch instead of uh, using ImageNet pre-trained models. Let me spend uh, some word to explain to those of you who are not familiar with Core 50, this data set and the associated protocols. Core 50 were, was first introduced in uh, 2017 at the conference on robotic learning. Each session, each acquisition session consists of a short video of about uh, 20 seconds at uh, 15 frames per second, so it's about uh, 300 frames. 
you can see that the frames are highly correlated because the user is moving smoothly moving the object in front of the camera there are different backgrounds different uh, lightings so the data set is quite difficult we have more than 164,000 images in Core 50. The format is RGBD. We are not currently using depth information, but they are available. And after cropping, the image size is 128 by 128. So this is a moderate size in the middle between Cypher, MNIST, and on the one side, and ImageJet on the other side. There are 10 macro categories, five objects per category. So if you perform classification at object level, there are 50 classes. There is a special NIC setting in Core 50, and there are three cases with uh, 79 incremental batches, 196 incremental batches, and 391 incremental batches. The third one is particularly challenging because here each batch includes only one session, one acquisition session, so one class, one object of one class, and about 300 frames. Core 50 was also selected and used in the CL Vision Challenge associated, uh, organized in conjunction with this uh, workshop. And if you are interested in the details, you can click in this link and find more information. Well, now I'm going to introduce some of the approaches that we developed in the past years for continuous object recognition. The main algorithm that we introduced is called AR1. And uh, AR1 is also the name of a rocket engine by Eurojet Rocket 9. So this is the reason for the, for the picture here. Uh, in our case, uh, A stands for architectural, R stands for regularization. So our approach uh, is a mix of architectural and regularization components. Um, in the first version here presented, AR1 works uh, without any rehearsal because uh, I believe that the interesting research question is, uh, is it possible to continuously learn from short non-IED batches without storing all the data? So the architectural component of AR1 is called CWR. It's a sort of dual memory system at, that works at the uh, output layer level. And uh, we have an online head and the offline head. For each training batch, for each incremental batch, the weights in the online head are reinitialized for the new classes and reload from the offline head for the already known classes. Then we perform training on the batch, and at the end of the training, the, the weights are consolidated in the offline heads by sort of weighted averaging. Similar ideas have been recently proposed by other researchers in methods called rebalance and scale. The regularization component takes place at the convolutional layers here in red, and in this case to control forgetting we limit the update of the important weights by using synaptic intelligence, which is similar to EWC, elastic weight consolidation. Uh, the advantage of synaptic intelligence is uh, in terms of uh, efficiency because uh, synaptic intelligence does not require to compute uh, the Fisher matrix by performing further gradient uh, propagation and computation. So it is better for our online implementation. And also we proposed a variant of the elastic weight consolidation update rule for the weights uh, that is more robust with respect to the training and also does not require to store the previous weights. 
The performance of uh, AR1 on Core 50 is uh, quite good in uh, NI and C and also NIC setting, except for the third case of NIC because uh, with 391 incremental batching, AR1 is not able to learn without rehearsal. So we initially uh, thought that the problem was the very small highly correlated batches because in this case uh, there is also one class frame of a single class in each batch only one session then after some deeper studies we understood that the main problem is not this one the main problem is uh, due to the batch normalization layers that in mobile net are present after each convolutional layer and as you know, batch normalization tend to uh, rescale and tend to um, normalize the activation based on the mini batch statistic. So it looks at the mean and standard deviation of the pattern in the mini batch and uh, renormalize the activation based on this statistic. However, if you have uh, very high co highly correlated frames, the standard deviation tends to be quite small and uh, best normalization tend to increase a lot the activation and also the statistic changes a lot at each batch so the model the model continuously shift its operating condition we found uh, a good solution to this problem by actually by replacing batch normalization with batch renormalization in batch renormalization, the normalization still uses the mini batch statistic, but combines the statistic with the sort of running averages of the standard deviation and the mean. So the update, the normalization is, is smoother, and the, the model performs much better with non-IED um, batches. You can see in these uh, in these graphics the accuracy of batch normalization, the dashed line and the accuracy of batch renormalization, the solid line. In 79 and 196 case, the performance is, uh, is, is better, but in the case of three, 391 batches, the accuracy improves a lot. In case of batch norm, the trend is nearly flat, no training, no, no improvement here, while in case of batch renorm, you have a near linear increase across the, the batches. Here I'm comparing the accuracy of AR1 with other well-known techniques on Core 50 NIC setting, including learning without forgetting, elastic weight consolidation, and the SLDA. As you can see, the accuracy of uh, AR1 is quite good in the three cases, 79, 196, 391, even if the, the gap with respect to the cumulative upper bound is, uh, is quite relevant. Okay, there are about uh, 20 points of gap, and the cumulative upper bound refer to the case of uh, offline training on the entire data set, so this is a sort of upper bound in terms of accuracy. So because of this gap, an interesting question is, uh, can we improve AR1 accuracy if we store some representative of the old data, so using some rehearsal, but without, without affecting efficiency? Before presenting our solution, just a few comments on rehearsal, because uh, there are some um, practical issues that need to be considered. Mm, as you know, rehearsal requires to store um, representative of all data, and uh, this uh, extra storage is not a big issue if uh, you have a small data set. But for example, for ImageNet, even if you store just uh, 20 patterns per class, the total extra storage is about 3.8 gigabyte. But uh, I think that there is another issue more critical and that is uh, often overlooked and this is the extra computation in terms of extra forward and backward steps. In fact, if you mix uh, the 
real data with the new data, the number of iterations per epoch increases, and uh, so your training is, is typically slower. So our approach is to perform uh, Riachal uh, without storing uh, raw data or raw images, but storing some activation at an intermediate layer that we call latent replay layer. So our model is, uh, can be divided in three parts. The blue layers here typically extract low-level generic features, so we, must, we can uh, train this layer slowly or freeze the weight. And then we have this uh, latent replay level, the red one, where we have an external storage to store the uh, activations for representative of the old data. And finally, we have the yellow layers at the top of the model. And uh, typically, these layers uh, tend to extract a very class class-specific discriminative features, so we must train them at full pace. What is important to note here is that um, the native data of the current batch, uh, of course, flow from the input layer and then are concatenated with uh, real data at this layer and the, at mini-batch level, of course, and the mini-batch uh, then traverse the upper part of the network. So also the real data traverse the upper part of the network, but not the lower part. Okay, so the efficiency can be increased a lot in this way. And this is the solution that we used for the um, near real-time training in the core application that I have shown you at the beginning of this talk. So there are, with latent replay, there are advantages in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of storage, because typically the size of the activation at latent replay is smaller than the size of the raw data. And some researchers also observed that uh, activation can be highly compressed or quantized up to one order of magnitude without uh, relevant uh, uh, drops in terms of accuracy. I have not time now to enter into the detail of activation sparsity, but you can sparsify uh, and compress a lot the activation at latent replay level. Well, here on the left, uh, we are comparing the accuracy of uh, AR1 without Riachal, the dashed line, and with Riachal, the red line, solid line here. And they are compared with the cumulative upper bound. As you can see, the gap now is reduced a lot. And this, uh, by using only 1,500 um, pattern for latent uh, replay, and this is about 1% uh, of the entire data set, so a small amount of data for Riasha. On the right side, we are comparing uh, accuracy by moving the position of the Riasha uh, of the replay level. So the red curve denotes uh, replay at image level, at the raw data level, and the blue curve denotes the accuracy when we move up to the output layer the, the, the Riachal. And in the middle here, we push down, we move down the Riachal layer. And is it very interesting to note that after four or five layers, the accuracy is uh, near constant. And this is a very good trade off at this point between uh, accuracy and efficiency. Well, here. We are comparing accuracy of AR1 with other techniques, uh, including iCarl, this curve. Unfortunately, iCarl was not conceived to work under NIC setting, so we did some modification, but we were not able to, to learn, to learn uh, in this difficult uh, scenario with 391 batches. Now I am approaching to the end of my talk, 
So I would like to provide you some information about our current and future research. We are currently trying to replace the um, memory, the external replay memory with the generative model. This is not only to, to avoid the extra storage, but in principle with the generative model you can generate an unlimited amount of, of data for training. So this is very appealing. Even if uh, uh, genera generating uh, useful data for, uh, for training is not, is not a simple task. In fact, there are some practical issues. First, you must be able to train the generator continuously in the loop. And uh, until now, researchers were able to generate useful images for a simple data set, for M MNIST, Cypher 10, but uh, not for more complex cases like Cypher 100, ImageNet, or Corfitti. So image generation for training with complex data set at raw level is very challenging. Recently, some researchers proved that uh, generating features instead of images, instead of raw, raw data, was effective in their experiment. And this is very interesting for us because of our latent replay. But also in this case, the generation was performed at the semi last level where the features are one dimensional and, uh, and also the size of the feature is quite small. In our case, we would like to generate complex 3D activation volumes, so it's much more challenging. And also because of our near real time um, constraints, we would like, to, we, we must avoid two complex uh, models, like for example, gun training uh, and so on. So it's uh, quite difficult. Uh, frankly speaking, we are having some problems and uh, I hope we will be able to solve them in the future. Finally, in the future, we intend to move toward uh, unsupervised training or weekly supervised training. Coming back to the application I have shown you at the beginning of the talk, you note that all the training steps are supervised by the user while it would be nice, for example, for a robot to automatically trigger the learning as it sees new objects or new instances of known objects. This, of course, requires moving to open set classification and also maybe using self-training approaches. In general, I think that using videos instead of single frames it would be very useful because you can exploit temporal coherence as a sort of surrogate signal and also fuse the confidence uh, from uh, consecutive frames. Uh, this can be useful for self-training. Uh, for all this development, I think that Core 50 is uh, an interesting data set, so I invite to you, you to use it. That's all. Thank you very much for your attention and bye-bye.